Good evening. My name is Gregory Thomas, your MC for this evening, and the 38th National President of, of Noble, and also a very proud member of the New York chapter of Noble. It's my pleasure to welcome you to an annual event that is co-sponsored by Noble and the John Jay College of Criminal Justice to honor the legacy and life of Lloyd J. Seeley. Through his life and through his living, Lloyd Seeley embodied the core principles of two of the noted of his two of his noted loves, Noble and John Jay College of Criminal Justice. And we are happy that through this annual partnership that both John Jay, of, John Jay College of Criminal Justice and Noble are having, we are doing our part to keep his legacy alive. The Lloyd J. Seeley Lecture Series has become a mainstay of John Jay College of Criminal Justice. It's become a legacy and one that's been fully embraced by the administration, faculty, and students here at the college. The New York chapter has long enjoyed a strong relationship with the college, and we are pleased that this relationship has continued under the current leadership of John Jay College President, Ms. Carol Mason, who will join us a little later. In 1976, as one of the 60 founding members of Noble, Lloyd Seeley was concerned about the rising rate of crime in our communities and saw it fit with his colleagues to create a national body that would address this issue and others that were unique to urban America like the hiring and promotion of black police officers and executives. Lloyd Seeley could personally relate to this struggle and the challenges facing black police executives because in his 34 years in the New York City Police Department, he achieved notoriety as a rising, as a rising star. Excuse me. He was the NYPD's first African-American graduate of the prestigious FBI National Academy and the third African-American promoted to the rank of captain. And through his tireless efforts and take charge demeanor, Lloyd Seeley soon went on to become the first African-American to command a precinct in Harlem. And in 1965, he was promoted to the position of assistant chief inspector, at that time, there, therefore, bypassing the then ranks of inspector and deputy chief. In his position, he was asked to command a patrol borough, particularly Brooklyn North, again, a first time at, at that time for African-Americans. His love for policing and criminal justice did not stop at the precinct level. After his retirement from NYPD, Lloyd Seeley became known as Professor Seeley as he took a position here at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. It's been told that he was a student favorite and a mentor and a friend to his colleagues in the Department of Law and Police Science. His untimely death at the age of 68 was a loss to the entire John Jay College of Criminal Justice community. And evidence of that loss and the mark that he left on both the college and Noble uh, it can be found through this yearly event, but also found in the library here at John Jay College, which bears his name, which is the largest library in the United States dedicated to the field of criminal justice. So if I were to ask to be talking more about Mr. Seeley, I could do this all day, but it's time now for also to have some remarks on behalf of the college as I ask you to join me in welcoming Dr. Jessica Gordon Newbhard, who is the chair of African Studies here at the College of John Jay Criminal Justice. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. It's wonderful to see you all, to have you here. Welcome to John Jay. I'm proud and happy that the Africana Studies Department is hosting this event with Noble, our 28th Lloyd Seeley Lecture, one of the longest running events in John Jay College of Criminal Justice, celebrating the life, as you heard, of our own Lloyd George Seeley, and remember all, remembering all of his accomplishments, especially as a teacher and scholar, in addition to being a top-ranking police professional in the NYPD. This is my second year as chair of Africana Studies, and so my second year doing the welcome for this event. We have another excellent program for you, so I'm very excited to get us going. And as you heard, our college president couldn't be here at the beginning, but she's coming to give the closing remarks. So you'll also hear from her. Many thanks to Noble, the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives, for co-sponsoring and supporting this event throughout. I want to thank in particular Gregory Thomas for being the um, Master of Ceremonies, and Chief Harrison 
for coming and supporting us as well, and you'll hear from her in a minute. Also thanks to Chief Vera Bumpers for giving us your time and energy um, to be here. Sorry, I just realized I had pointed to Chief Harrison. I pointed the wrong place to Chief Harrison. <laughs> sorry. That <laughs> I'm so sorry, it's been a long day. <laughs> You'll see who she is in a minute, but anyway, over here, Chief Harrison, and over here, Chief Bumpers. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> um, I also want to acknowledge our Lord Seely Library and Ellen Backler and Larry Sullivan from the library because they actually create a little exhibit, a mini exhibit every year that we do this. It's outside, so you'll see it when you go for refreshments. Um, it's just a little history library exhibit about the content, um, you know, the, the topic of our coverage. So this year it's about um, women in uh, policing. And so you'll see they, they did some, uh, some historical coverage of that. So it's really wonderful that they do that. We're so excited that they partner with us on that. And you'll see it in our, outside in our Justice Quad um, in a minute. I also need to thank... Um, my department's senior co-curricular administrator, Relisa Galloway-Perry, and her work-study student, Leslie Ann Batista, because they both really worked tirelessly to make sure everything went right and that the program came out well and that you're all here and that kind of stuff. So I want to thank them. We have students in the room I want to thank. Professor Yvette Strong from Noble has brought 15 students from Long Island University. I have John Jay Professor um, Dominique Day brought her students from our AFR 213 Police and Urban Communities class. Thanks for coming. And then a few of my students from uh, 227 Community-Based Approaches to Justice are here. So I'm really glad we've got students here as well as Noble members and our own, um, the rest of the John Jay community. Just quickly, I think I'm almost out of time. I just want to tell you that Africana Studies here at John Jay is an interdisciplinary department. We have a special focus on studies of Africa and the African diaspora, especially African American experiences and knowledge in regards to racism, resistance, resilience, and rebuilding. We cover history, sociology, political economy, philosophy, psychology, cultural studies, and so that's what we mean by being interdisciplinary. And we recently offer a special focus on all aspects of community justice, and we just inaugurated last year a new minor called Community Justice Minor, in addition to our Africana Studies Minor and our Honors Minor. And we're also the partners in designing a new major called Human Services and Community Justice, which also includes that community-based approaches to justice focus. So welcome, everybody. Enjoy the evening. And thank you so much for coming. Thank you, doctor. Uh, I aired at the beginning as your MC to give you a couple of uh, rules of the game, so please silence your cell phones if you haven't done that already. And just because of where we are, if something were to happen here, an emergency of some sort, you know where your exits are, to your right and to your left. Um, studies show that sometimes people panic and don't know where to go. If that were to happen, you could follow me, I'm out of here. So just <laughs> make it a little simpler for you. Um, now it's time also to hear some remarks from our local chapter president. Before I introduce her formally, I just want to say that she's been uh, graced with the opportunity recently by the NYPD to be the new commanding officer of our sex crimes unit here as a deputy chief. Uh, she also hails as being the first woman chapter president of the New York chapter of Noble. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming President Judy Harris. Harrison. Good evening, everybody. Uh, good evening, distinguished guests, noble members, John Jay faculty, and John Jay students. I'm Judith Harrison, and yes, I am the commanding officer. Oh, excuse me, I'm not the commanding officer here. I am noble president, and on behalf of the noble New York chapter, I want to welcome you to the 28th annual Lloyd Seeley Lecture. For years, John Jay has been educating and preparing scholars to become successful professionals in the field of criminal justice. 
I, for one, am proud to say that I am a John Jay alum, alumni. I just graduated just a few short months ago. Um, there's some other notable uh, John Jay alumni, such as um, first Deputy Commissioner Benjamin Tucker. I'm sure some of you in the room are alumni or endeavoring to be alumni. Um, and also Lloyd George Seeley was an alumni. Not only was he an alumni of John Jay and a John Jay professor, he was the first African American precinct commander in NYPD commanding the 28th precinct in Harlem. He was also the person for whom John Jay's library is named after and one of the founding members of NOBLE, the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives. Lloyd George Seeley was the epitome of professionalism. Both a law enforcement professional and a scholar, he personified ambition, determination, and he lived his life as an example for others to emulate. He was community policing before there was community policing. Several pictures circulating about him. If you Google, you'll see him walking in the neighborhood, talking to children, talking to people. He was the beat cop before there was the beat cop. He was the original beat cop. He understood that cops and community needed to work together, and that's exactly what he did. And he was a shining example of that. To John Jay President Carol Mason and members of the Africana Studies Department, we thank you for your support and we thank you for your partnership with Noble. And to our national president, Vera Bumpers, thank you so much for being here. I understand and I know that the demands on your schedule are great, but you saw fit to be here. We appreciate that so much more than we could ever express. So we're looking forward. You can clap for that. Thank you. She's here all the way from Houston for this event. That's how important this event was to her. So we thank you, we support you, we uplift you, and we're looking forward to your uh, presentation today. Thank you. Thank you, President Harrison. I apologize for saying Harris before, it's clear. Now, if I were to ask, if I were asked to be, to put the mission or an intended charge of this lecture series into a few words, I would say would be to bring forth a speaker who is a recognized leader in their respective community and in the field of criminal justice, and one that can leave the academic, law enforcement, and lay audience with thought-provoking comments and perspectives that address the many challenges facing the criminal justice and public safety communities. So John Jay and Noble, we did it again. Uh, her, her bio is in the uh, brochure you have before you. I, I'm not going to take time to read that. I want you to read it for yourselves. But I will say that uh, in addition to her being the 41st national president of Noble, she's also a good friend of the New York chapter, has always been that way. Um, I need to, at the outset, Madam President, apologize. Um, you know, New York does it big. So we had her up this morning at 7 o'clock. Um, you know, got her, with the NYPD's assistance, out to the police academy in Queens, where they are currently having, today they had, a two-day session on women leadership conference in the NYPD, so she got a chance to go to that, to see the academy. Uh, we then took her from there to One Police Plaza, uh, where she met with First Deputy Commissioner Tucker, got a chance to see the real-time crime center, uh, the Joint Operations Center, to tour the entire building, Escorted by Assistant Chief Kim Royster. I had to say that because it's my wife. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, I also forgot that you arrived last evening. I, I left one part out. That's, I didn't do it chronologically. You arrived last evening, and thanks to the assistance of Dr. Sophie Charles and others in the chapter, you were uh, phrased to go to a Broadway play, right? We do it big here. We don't play. <laughs> So, so back to today, so after she left Police Plaza and met with Commissioner Tucker, First Deputy Commissioner Tucker for a while, we then took her to uh, see Chief Delatore, who is the police chief in charge of the Transit Bureau in the NYPD, her equal. Spent time there for most of the time that you could and um, got a PowerPoint presentation learning about what we do here in New York City. And then we thought it fit to uh, bring her back to the hotel for a little while and then you're here. What a day. So we apologize. We just do it big. 
So again, you have her bio before you. I, I want to, you know, again, thank you for taking the time out in your busy schedule, traveling around the country as you do, representing the organization as you do. We appreciate that. And last I'll say, she is the first of three in succession, the incoming president, or rather the first uh, national first vice president, CJ, as we call her, CJ Davis, is the president coming in next year in July, rather this year in July already, wow, time's flying, in New Orleans, but she's also the current police chief in Durham, North Carolina, and behind CJ is Miss Linda Williams, who's a retired deputy chief or deputy agent, uh, supervisor, supervising agent in charge of the Secret Service. So we have three women in, in a row coming in to be uh, president of the organization. We, we, we are proud and noble that we take this task seriously as it relates to being fair and equitable, and we're looking forward to the moments you're gonna spend with us today and tell us more about your career. And I'll say also, ma'am, there's gonna be a question and answer period afterwards that'll be moderated appropriately so there won't be too many questions and answers afterwards, okay? So with that, please welcome the 41st National President, Chief Vera Bumpers. Good evening. Okay, just a little bit. Oh, I am so excited to be here. Thank you so much. I want to do a little uh, my thank yous first before I get started. I would first of all like to recognize uh, the noble executive board members that are here. I think we have two. We have two, man. Two. Okay. Thank you so much. And then I'd like to recognize the New York chapter, because that should be everybody in the room, right? <laughs> thank you so much. And special thank you to Dr. Charles, who uh, took me to my first Broadway play, and it was so good. Thank you so much. We went to see The Temptations. And it was excellent. Thank you so much. I want to say thank you to Tanya. Is Tanya here? Tanya Colley? Okay, Tanya picked me up from the airport, took me to a restaurant. I said, Tanya, have you ever been here? No, this is my first time. So I think I, we were sharing first time. So it was a good restaurant, though, and I want to thank Tanya. And I'd also like to thank Chief Judy Harrison. Did I say it right, Judy? Okay. And Chief Kim Royster gave me an excellent tour today. Uh, their staff was just superb in helping me and supporting me, and I just want to say thank you. I really appreciate it. And of course, Gregory Thomas, who kept checking on me, Madam President, you okay? You need anything? He is so organized, and he had everything organized, so thank you so much. I really appreciate the fact that you all thought enough to invite me. It's very special for me. It's very humbling, and I'm just excited to be here. Um, I'm going to share a little bit and definitely welcome your questions afterwards. Uh, this has been a ride for me, being the noble national president, just as it has been me being the chief of police for Metro Transit Police. I have been with Metro, and you'll see in the bio, for over 35 years now, I guess 37 years. Been there a long time. Uh, I was the first female hired, first African-American female hired at the department. When I got there, there was only one other female, white female. And she left uh, about six months after I got hired to go to law school. So I was the only female there uh, for about a year until they hired another female. And then I was the first female in every rank in the department. So first sergeant, lieutenant, captain, assistant chief, and then chief. And thank you. I always tell people that you see my breakthrough, but you don't know my been through. And it, it's, it has not been easy, uh, as Judy and I were talking earlier, uh, when you ascend to leadership roles. It's not easy. And people see, oh, this is all glamorous and glorious. But it's, it's tough moving forward in this leadership role because of what you have to encounter. One of the things that I said when I was sworn in, because just to move back a little bit, I didn't apply to be chief. I was good where I was. <laughs> so 
it took me forever to, to make captain because there were no openings. So when the opening came up, I applied and I was promoted to captain. And so I said, well, I'm good. I can retire as a captain. I'm good at this pay. So um, two years captain and then uh, the assistant chief left. So I said, well, maybe I'll apply for assistant chief. I'm not the chief, so I don't have to worry about doing nothing. I see the assistant chief just, you know, can't do it. I, I can do that. I can retire at that pay scale. And so I did. I applied for assistant chief. So I'd been assistant chief, and I, I got the promotion. And I'd been assistant chief for two weeks. And they called me in, and uh, they wanted to speak with me, the CEO. And I thought, I said, well, I know I've been doing okay. I'm doing what most assistant chiefs do, make phone calls, go to meetings, tell people what to do. <laughs> so I went in, and uh, the CEO said, uh, we want to make you the chief. I said, me? You sure? That's not on my bucket list. It's not, that's when not in my plans to be the chief. I, you know, I see what chiefs go through. And uh, he said, yeah, you ready. We want you to be the chief. So I said, well, can I think about it? Because it really was not in my plans. So I went to my car, and uh, I sat there for a minute. I called my husband, and I told him. I said, guess what? They, they want me to be the chief. He said, what's the problem? He said, there's more money, right? What's the problem? <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, I don't need to talk to you. So I hung up. and so. I do what I normally do. I talk to God. And uh, I said, God, why now? Why? I'm in the fourth quarter. I'm right here at the, not the 20-yard line. I'm at the goal post right here. I'm right here. Why now? And he said clearly to me, this is not about you. It's about purpose. So I had to understand that this was about purpose. And so many times, and we're talking about the changing roles of women in law enforcement, and it has changed. Um, that, for me, that signified a huge shift for me. Started with a mindset, because as I said, that, that's not where mentally I was. And as women, we do have that propensity to step back. Naturally, we're nurturers, we care about people, we want to see the best. And you see now women all over the country that are becoming leaders in agencies that are moving up. Not at a rapid pace, it's a, a trickle, but we're taking that. But it's, it's tough because you come into this profession, you come into this leadership role, and you can read all the books you want, but nobody actually prepares you for what you're gonna come up against when you're sitting in the chair. Uh, even as officers, we know of tough times that we go through. But once you get to the chair, you're looking back like, okay, where is, where is somebody? Show me what I'm supposed to do. Nobody really told me what to do. So you go to training, you do all that, but it's still not enough. And when we talk about, for me, it's about value. You start out with value. Okay, do I bring value to where I am? Do I add something? Do I, am I just at the table just to be at the table, or am I bringing value and saying something while I'm at the table? Because it's more than just getting there. We have a, a responsibility to make an investment once we get there. And so value, we don't always value ourselves. Just like when I said to him, me? Are you sure that others see something in you that you don't even see in yourself? And so I had to understand, I had to say to myself, and you know we all get up in the morning and we look at each other, look at ourselves as we're getting ready. And I know some of you, you may not openly have that conference call with yourself, but I know mentally you, you're going through your day, you're preparing. So I had to look at myself in the mirror and say, okay, you bring value. You, you, can, you have something to say. You have something to bring to this profession. And so I had to look at across the country there are other women leaders, like Chief Royster, uh, like Chief C.J. Davis. Right now, there are, in major cities, there are 12 female chiefs in major cities. Seven of those are African-American women. And I'm happy to say all seven are noble members. So that says a lot. 
because when I came in, I didn't see that. I didn't see that example, but now we see it. And it's just not at the chief level. What I always like to tell people, you can learn from somebody whose boots on the ground, a line officer. No matter what your role is, you bring something that we all can learn from. So it's always important. We don't look down at anybody when you get there. And I, I, I don't have to work hard at being humble. I try to, I've always been an humble person and not wanting to be out there. But when I look at these women, I think about, you know, serving in major cities. I, I wonder, you know, who is pouring back into them as they're pouring out? Who's reminding them you're valuable? I don't care what you're going through, you bring value. And then we move forward from value, we talk about validation. So many times we look to others to validate us. You're good, you, you make sense, you're smart, you're sometimes cute, you know, you can do this. You know, what do we look to for our validation? And sometimes it's the wrong places. I like the story of Harriet Tubman. Uh, when Harriet Tubman uh, talks about when she always went back to get others, to bring other slaves out, and she said, I would have brought more out if they had known they were slaves. Sometimes we have that slave mentality, and that's why we need that validation. And one of the things that I, I know that when God puts that purpose in you, it doesn't matter what anybody says. You're going to move forward. I don't need your validation. So, and I think about with Harriet Tubman, uh, when Harriet Tubman died, Rosa Parks was born the same year. And a lot of times people talk about Rosa Parks. They say, well, you know, Rosa Parks was tired. That's why she sat in the front. Rosa Parks said, I was tired of giving up. So she had made her mind up. I don't need validation from anybody. I don't have to go to the back. So when we get to that point where we change our mindset and understand that it's beyond us, and I don't need anybody to validate me, my goal should be to go and validate other people. I'm always trying to encourage men and women who work with me to let them know, I, you know, I think I shared with Judy, I've been there, done that. I, I, my goal now is to shine your star, to make sure you're ready when your name is called. Because when my name was called, that wasn't on my mind. But we always have to get into that mindset. So one of the things I like to say about validation is that validation is only important to the degree that I need it from you, and I don't. <laughs> so we have to remember that. We don't need anybody to validate us. You just do your best. So we move from value, we're going to value ourselves, value others, see the value in others, support each other, and then validation. We move from value to validation. And when you put those two together, you're going to have victory. But victory doesn't mean it's time for me to sit down, I've arrived. Judy, it doesn't mean that, Kim, it doesn't mean that. We've not, we're there at the table, but what is your voice bringing to the table? The victory is not for you to get comfortable because it's not even about you. As God told me, it's about purpose. It's about who are you preparing to come behind you. And I say that about being number one. Being number one means nothing if there are not other numbers following me. It means nothing. And being number one, if I can't look back and say just as Harriet Tubman did, and say, you know what, you coming out. And you know, sometimes she had to pull her gun out because when she brought somebody, they said, I want to go back. No, you're not going back. <laughs> so there are times when we see people, we have to let them know when they start getting down and we're human and we get there sometimes. I always say one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible is iron sharpens iron. And I think God put it there because he knew we would get dull. Sometimes you get tired. You get tired of rocks being thrown. You get tired of knives coming from the back. You get tired of people trying to undermine, pull the rug. You get tired. So you need that core group of people in your uh, space to say, you can do this. Keep going. You need to be sharpened. God knew we would get dull. And so, so many times I'll ha I have groups of people that are outside of law enforcement, some in law enforcement, that we're a support group for each other. That say, you know what, I got you. And they mean that. 
And I always say, you don't have to be my ride or die because, you know, Jesus paid it all. I don't need you to die for me. I just need you to be my ride or push. That means you're going to ride with me when I got have gas and push when I don't. So that's what we need. I, I, I love where I am now. I love this space. I love sharing with people. I love letting people know that they're all valuable, that they bring something, that sometimes that gift is in there. It just has to be stirred up. And you have to know that you have to believe in yourself. And we're not going to always all agree, but we're not going to go out of our way to attack. And when people throw rocks, and, they, and I was uh, sharing with Kim, you know, I go through it all the time where people will throw rocks. And now what I say, if you throw rocks at me, I'm not going to throw back. I'm going to build bridges so somebody can follow me. And so we have to be about keeping our, our, the presence of mind to say, why am I here? What am I doing? When you understand your why, then you have no problem understanding I'm valuable, I'm validated, and I, I look forward to seeing all kind of victories. Understanding your why, not why I got into law enforcement, because I, I got into law enforcement because my father wouldn't answer the phone when I told him I wanted to get out. I said, come get me. I don't like this. I can't do this job. He said, hang in there. We got a bad connection. Hang in there. You can, you can do it. And he would hang up. And I said, you know, I, I, said, I'm gonna get, I called him. I said, you know, I'm in Houston because I'm from San Antonio. So I said, I'm in Houston, it's crazy out here, it's big, I'm going to get killed, it's just too many criminals. I said, I think I want to do something. He said, I'm telling you, hang in there and hang the phone up. So that, is, that was my why I stayed. But, you know, when I, <laughs> I got, when I was in the job, but then I looked, you know, that's why I got in it, but why do I stay? Why do I stay? And I think we need to stop and ask ourselves that. Why do I stay here? Because sometimes we get to a point, you know, I don't have to do this. And I'm at that point, I don't have to. But why do you stay? Why did you get in Noble? Why did I want to be the president? Not because I need it for my resume. I don't need it for my resume. I don't you know, need the extra headache. I can have rocks thrown at me in my own job. You know, I'm dealing with people. That's human. You know, when you throw them rocks at me, not both places. But it's because I know that Noble is necessary. It was necessary in 1976, it's still necessary now. Because there's still disparate treatment, there's still inequity, inequities, and we see it not only in our arena of our profession, but we see it in our communities. And our communities need us. They need us to bridge that gap. They need uh, to know that I don't care how high you go, you're there. You're there for us, we have a voice. We're that voice for those who don't, cannot speak. And we have to always remember that, that it's not about us. And I think that's the hardest thing when people get what they say, not get in your feelings. And I always say, you know, before I start some meetings at work, I say, is anybody in here in their feelings? Do we need to do a group hug? Because people get offended so easily by small things, and they quit and say, you know what, I'm out of here. Because you said something, you didn't look at me, you didn't speak, I don't think you like me. How do you know? It's, stop making it about you. There are people that are hurting. There are many men and women in our agencies that are looking for somebody. We can send them to all the classes we want to, but they're looking. I want to be like you, and you don't even know it, that you're mentoring people and you don't even know it. I always say more is caught than taught. They're watching you because they want to catch, okay, what is that doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? So they're always watching. So it's important how you carry yourself, how you walk, making sure your crown is straight, whether it's a king or queen crown. I don't care what's going on. It could always be worse. So we owe that to make sure that we are making standing tall, that we're exemplifying the best. Because we want those who are watching us, who are going to follow us, to bring it. We want them to bring the A game. We want them to come 100. So it's important what we do. So I just want you to, I wanted to come today to let you know, first of all, I don't care who you are, what your role is, you're valuable. I want you to know you're validated because you know, I always say God allowed you to still be here. As long as you're breathing, you have something to offer. And I tell people who try to say, well, I'm retired. You retooled, you're not retired. <laughs> you still have something to offer and we still need you. And then I want you to know Celebrate the victories. Celebrate these women who've ascended. 
to the chief's position. Support them. Pray for them because they need that. Find ways to say positives and not focus on the negatives. And so I just encourage you today to stay focused, know who you are and whose you are, and don't let anyone change you. Always know that no matter what comes out of your mouth, you know, we guard it, but we want you to say, I have a voice. I have a voice. So I thank you today for allowing me to come and share with you and open any questions that you may have. Here a second. Okay. You can. Okay. So if, if I'm going to take a little liberty here, a little podium liberty. We've been joined by the president of John Jay College of Criminal Justice, the honorable, I'm going to call her that, Carol Mason. And before she comes up, I'm just so glad to see her because she's a big fan of Noble. We've been, well, I was national president. You were at the Department of Justice. You helped us a lot. And you're still doing it now as, as president of uh, John Jay College of Criminal Justice. But on a personal note, last I saw her, she's also doing work in my office. And the Brooklyn DA's office. She did some work with us. We had a big town hall last week, mm -hmm. and she was there as part of the town hall. And at that point, you had laryngitis, mm -hmm. right? So I went to go hug her. She said, no, we did one of these things in the air, and you couldn't speak. So the fact that you're here and able to speak, I'm so happy to see that. Thank you. Now, without further ado, the president of John Jay College, <laughs> Carol Mason. Okay. <laughs> um, Chief Bubber is, is just amazing. So when you ended your remarks with about having a voice, mm -hmm. uh, you didn't know how literal that was. <laughs> um, so um, good evening, everybody. And as, as uh, he just said, last Tuesday morning, I woke up with no voice. There were four big speeches I was supposed to give last week and moderate something, and they were like, if you can't talk, how are you going to do this? I didn't. I just showed up. And sometimes showing up is, is, is powerful even when you don't have a voice. So I appreciate you all for showing up tonight. And I just want to say thank you for coming to speak to us. And not just coming to speak to us. Thank you for recruiting our students. Because they are hugely talented. And thank you for the example that you set for so many people. And I still remember the first time we met on the street at Noble. <laughs> Um, and Noble, you know, is, 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 as Gerald mentioned, is really a powerful organization that I am so proud to be able to continue to work with. When I was at the Department of Justice, and I'm, I must, oops, it'll go, so I have to tell you one quick story. Are they filming this? Real quick? All right. So I had no voice. Monday we had a snow day, and I still had no voice, and I needed to be able to talk. So I called my, I texted my brother and I said, we're in the same medical group. I said, I need you to call the doctor and I'll text you what to say to the doctor. So he said, why don't you just go to urgent care? I was like, what a novel concept. I'd never done that. I am 61 and I never thought about going to urgent care. That's because I'm from Atlanta and in the South, you just text your doctor and they deal with you. It's different in New York. So anyway, I went to urgent care and um, last week I was, writing notes back and forth with a former U.S. attorney who's on MSNBC a lot. and She said to me, uh, I said, I need a steroid pack. I was texting my doctor in Atlanta. I was like, call in a prescription. Here's the pharmacy number. I need a steroid pack so I can talk, because this happens every few years. So this woman said her husband wouldn't let her have a steroid pack because it made her too aggressive. I was like, <laughs> steroids don't do that to me. Well, this new doctor at the urgent care gave me a new steroid treatment. It is impacting me, so I'm a little bit more aggressive. <laughs> so I just need to give you all full disclosure that I'm not sure what I might say tonight. I have, a, I have remarks, but I'm going to speak from my heart. Um, I am so um, proud of this relationship with Noble and so proud of what Noble does. And I am particularly proud tonight, Chief Royster, um, with Chief Harrison, there you go, um, that we are, are f being acknowledging such powerful women and the role that women, women of color in particular, play in the success of, a, of an effective criminal justice system that people trust and want to partner with. Because we bring a different perspective. Um, we bring, you know, same level of passion, commitment, but, but a different voice yes. to, the, to, the, to, the, to the work 
that is powerful. And it takes all of our voices. It's no one voice. It's the shared voice, the shared conversation, the shared perspectives, because we don't all need to be saying the same thing. We reach better decisions when we're all in here working together. And so I know that Lloyd Seeley, who I never had the pleasure of meeting, but several of you did, is looking down on this room and in this lecture that, that happens every year in his honor and thinking, this is what I seeded. The representation we have in this room, the representation we have in law enforcement across the country, the representation of students coming out of John Jay, those who go into law enforcement and wear the uniform, and those who go into other careers that, that require them to, to interact with law enforcement are the better because of the legacy of what he created when he was commander in Brooklyn and, and understand the importance of relationships between communities, particularly communities of color and law enforcement, and having um, a justice system and law enforcement leaders in particular that represent the community. And by represent the community, it's not just who you look like, it's that you understand their experience and not just understand it, but that you value that experience and that you make judgments based on understanding those perspectives. So I wanna thank you all tonight for coming to hear from a powerful, powerful, powerful voice for leadership in our law enforcement in the form of this uh, wonderful woman, Chief Bumper. So please join me in thanking her again. And again, um, well, everybody, Who's a member of Noble, please stand up. I, I see double hands going up in the background for somebody who's already standing. Can we give you all a round of applause again for the work that you all do? Um, thank you. And what you may not know about Chief Harris, she was, you can see that, she was um, in the first graduating class of our, our, our um, law enforcement master's program, and I believe the first one to get promoted too. Wow. Weren't you? Yeah. yeah, so let's give her another big round of applause. Um, and again, the, the, the work that Noble does, and I, you know, how things are so circular, the organization that I had the good fortune to lead the last um, four years of the Obama administration was the organization that seeded the money to create Noble. And so I love the ability to continue to stay in this work and stay engaged with all of you all. And so I am counting on you all to help us continue to educate this next generation of officers who share your perspectives. And thank you for hiring them. So look forward to, I think we're gonna to go to the awards now. A oh, I forgot. Yes. See, you shouldn't, I told you that steroid was that, giving me a little <laughs> bit more aggression. Thank you guys. <laughs> Thank you. Is this one? Okay, good. Thank you. So Madam President, we'll have a little Q&A, okay. little rules in the game. One question per person, please. We've had in the past people asking five questions. We're going with one, okay, going with one. One good one, all right? Uh, also, we'll do this for about 10 minutes or so, okay. a little less than that if need be. We'll just try to balance the process. So the first question, anybody? I'm Oprah for a day. May I start? Oh, you're way over there. Yeah. Oh, I got one here. Sorry. Yeah, one here. Okay, good. Hey, please tell us where you're from, too, if you mm -hmm. My name is Eleanor Edmond. I'm from Long Island Business Institute. I came okay. along with um, noble member Yvette Strong. Oh, yes. Um, I am... Um, a former uh, military personnel, and I'm looking to transition into the law enforcement field. Mm -hmm. But um, being a, a black woman growing up in the streets of Brooklyn, it's not too motivating. What would be your encourage your words of encouragement for a person like me? I would first say that if you have an opportunity, and there's a lot of noble members here, is to connect with someone who is already in law enforcement. And so they can share with you, so they can give you some guidance in how um, they made it in and what to expect. So it's real. It's not just something you're reading. And the, the brochure gives you all the nice and pretty and, oh, come and be a part of us. But you need to speak with someone who's actually doing the job. And I think I would start uh, with someone in the chapter. Uh, one of the things when I talked about when I first got in law enforcement calling my dad, um, is because one of my very first calls I went on, you know, I'm a black female, but I'm also sweet and low. That's short. That's my version of short. And so when I went to the first call, the lady said uh, it was a disturbance. She said, they sent you? I said, yes. She said, I'm leaving because you're going to get your butt kicked. <laughs> so <laughs> that's when I... So not 
hadn't talked to anybody, didn't really know what to expect. You just go to the job. So I think it's a good opportunity to network. There are a lot of law enforcement. There are some uniform ladies in the back. Thank you so much for being here. But that's where I would start, have that conversation with someone who's already doing the job. OK, thank you, Madam President. If I can, I've done this for a while as the mm -hmm. MC. This is the largest audience we had in a long time, right? So. Mm -hmm. Credit to you. Thank you. Thank you for Thank doing you that. all for coming. Thank you. All right, next question. I'll take the liberty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Madam President, um, you talked about you growing up in, and you also talked about your career in law enforcement. And as we know, this room is filled with law enforcement, mm -hmm. whether it be female or male. Mm -hmm. Could you just uh, expound upon the fact of no matter what in law enforcement, you are going to face fear, whether mm -hmm. it's on the job with your counterparts or moving up the ranks. How would you deal with that? Uh, that's a good question because you do face fears. Uh, one of the things I say is that as you move up and become a leader, you're always giving out. And it's almost who's putting back in your cup because you dip in here, you dip in. You know, as women, we're used to multitasking. We master multitasking. We can go to the soccer game, the football game, uh, take kids, cook, wash, go to work, do everything. So we're used to that. And so, and we're, we're naturally, we're nurturers, we're caring. Um, so some of the things that I had to do, uh, first and foremost, I had to have a strong prayer life. And I'm just speaking for me, I had to have that um, to get through some of the, the tough times. And then I made sure that I had someone that I could talk to. You need to have persons that you can go to and actually pour out and you know they're going to give you sound advice, sound guidance. You can't share with everybody. I had to learn that the hard way. Everybody that wears the blue uniform, everybody, we're all good. They're not all supportive of you. And that's just the reality of it. So I don't want to paint this picture that every, we all, you know, we all long, we all good. No, it's not always like that. So it's important for you to know that you are going to face tough times. But never was quitting an option for me. I said when they promoted me and they asked me did I have, want to say something after they swore me and I, I said I have one thing to say. My goal is to please God. And I want to make God proud. Amen. So if I kept that as my focus, it didn't matter what was going on around me. And I'm, I knew I was going to do the right thing, no matter what. If, you don't, if I change policies, if I do something, if I move people around, they don't like it. But my thing was I'm doing what I feel is best, and I have no hidden agenda, no motives. My heart is pure. I'm going to do the right thing. It was always about doing the right thing and what was best for the agency, for me. And so we have to understand that, that it's not going to always be rosy. It's not always going to be fun. But when those fun times, I'm one of those people, I like to laugh and have fun. So I do like the balance. We have to balance. Sometimes we put so much into work, we forget about home. And I tell officers coming in, I have a talk before I swear them in, and I let them know, don't forget about home. Make sure that you have, as, even with the shift, you may not work a shift where you can be at all every event your children are having, but make sure you call and let them know, mom, dad, I have to work. Have balance in your life. Don't work all these side jobs and put your family second. So it's important to have balance. It's important to have people in your arena that you can talk to, you can call. It's important. And it doesn't always have to be the same rank. I have uh, friends who I reach out to, that talk to, that may be an officer, but we've been friends for a long time, but I know they're going to be honest with me. So it's good to have that. Uh, one of the things with the CEO symposium we had this last weekend at Noble, I wanted to create a safe space for chiefs and assistant chiefs and sheriffs so they could talk openly. And uh, it worked out really well. So some of those, I think, uh, Judy went. But you were able to just to share. Because then you start listening to somebody. Oh, you say, oh, I had that problem too. You had that problem. That problem wasn't in the book, though. How did you work it out? So we have to find ways to make sure that we have balance, that we have good people all around us, and that we understand that you're going to go through tough times. Weapons will be formed, but they won't prosper. <laughs> uh, 
Um, good afternoon. I mean, evening, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, my question for you is, what made you decide to, oh, my name is Kevin Williams. Um, <laughs> my, my question to you is, what made you decide to take leadership roles in your organization, especially since you were the first mm -hmm. of everything? I decided to do that because I was trying to help others. I remember um, when I came to Noble, I was a sergeant, and I didn't tell anybody. I, it was a conference. I, it may have been Atlanta. I'm not sure where it was, but I went on my own time, my own dime. And then I also went to uh, uh, another conference, African American Police Officers Association Conference. And there, I just listening and watching, and I saw so many leaders and just hearing some of the issues they were talking about in their agencies, and I was saying, that's the same thing going on in my agency, but nobody's stepping up. And so I decided, if I don't, who will? So I decided to that I was going to pursue and promote, and one of the things that the chief said to me once, um, because when I saw something that wasn't right, I would, can, can I make an appointment? Can I talk to you? Not being disrespectful, but I see some things going on. I don't think it's fair. It's not right. And can I, you know, can you help me understand it? That's not being insubordinate. And so he told me, he said, why do you always fight for everybody? Why do you always come? You're always the one that steps out, speak up. Why do you do that? I said, because if I don't, I don't see anybody around here that will. And so I saw that it was important. And, and a little bit about me. Originally, my mom, my family's from Alabama. So I saw going back and forth from Texas to Alabama, um, that we would be pulled over, harassed by law enforcement for no reason. Um, and it went on all the time. We'd go three or four times back because all our family was there. And I remember that I think this is when what really shaped me for law enforcement is that I asked my dad, I said, they always pull you over. They throw all our stuff on the side of the road. We go places. And he said, can my family use the restroom? No. Uh, can we eat it? No. And so I said, why you don't say so? I just had bold that night in the back seat. I was like, because every time, you know, the police pull you over, my mother, everybody be quiet. We all. So when he got back in the car, I said, why you never say nothing? You let them do that, then you don't say anything. He said, I have to protect my family. You don't understand. It's ignorant people in the world, but I, gotta, I have to protect my family. So from that, I just felt like I had to protect those who are not or being, not being treated fairly. I saw how people did leadership wrong, and I wanted to be the one to show them how you can do it right. Hi there, uh, Hi. I'm Dominique Day. I teach here at John Jay. I teach a race and policing class, and a pack of my students are in the room. Uh, I'm, <laughs> they're excellent. I'm hoping they'll have a chance to speak yes. with some of you personally yes. afterwards. Wonderful. Um, and I want to thank you for your words. I thought that was very inspiring, and I really think uh, we've all taken a lot from it. Yeah. I guess my question is, um, what do you think you draw on from your own education? What's in your toolkit? We sp I spent a lot of time trying to focus on teaching critical thinking skills mm -hmm. and hope that my students, many of whom want to be police officers, mm -hmm. will really have that as a resource as mm -hmm. they go forward. But for you personally, and what would you advise them to think about and to learn about while they're here in this educational environment? The critical thinking skills is huge because there are so many situations where you are going to have to make decisions, and you don't have time to flip through. You don't have time to Google it. You have to make a decision. So it's important to sharpen your critical thinking skills. Uh, something um, Michelle Obama said on her tour, her book tour I went to, she said, uh, my parents said, told us, I'm raising adults. I'm not raising children. Mm -hmm. And they, she said they focused on them making critical decisions, those critical thinking skills. And so that was sharpened, apparently, in her and her brother at an early age. So you see how it benefited them. So it's important to learn from others also. I like reading books about from other chiefs, other leaders, not necessarily all in law enforcement, but just to see how they navigated through problems how they problem solve. So I think that's very important, the problem solving, because you'll be confronted with it not only in the profession, but in your personal life. You will have to do some critical thinking problem solving. Today's times is totally different. So a lot of 
the, the skill sets that we use in our profession, we also use in our personal lives. So I would encourage you to do that and focus on that. I think that's great. Hi, yeah, I just had a quick question. Actually, it's very similar, so I guess we professors think similar. If yeah. Anybody who came in late, I'm Jessica Gordon. I'm hard chair of Africana Studies Department here at John Jay. I was gonna ask you, and I actually, I think I'm asking it every year now, um, we're starting or we're in the middle of this program on community justice and what would you want us to be teaching, especially since you hire some of our <laughs> students, what yeah. kinds of things, particularly in community justice or community-based approaches to justice, would you want to make sure our students understand, know, or think about? How to interact with the community. I think that's key right now in law enforcement, learning how to interact with cultures that are not necessarily like your own. Uh, the Federal Bureau of Investigations, FBI, they have a program where it's called cross-cultural mentoring, where you're forced to mentor someone who does not look like you. I think that's an excellent program. And it's, it's very important now that, that we learn how to interact with other communities. What we see going on, especially in the political arena, is so much division. The conversation causes so much divide. So one of the things, my word for this year, I always come up with a word, it was intentional. And I said, I was going to be intentional about having conversations and engaging with people who I don't normally talk to or who don't look like me, and trying to learn not only from them, but educate them on my culture, who I am. You know, in law enforcement, we kind of roll our eyes because we went through the phase of culture diversity, and now we're in implicit bias. And it's almost like, you're always trying to teach me how to be, be around other people. You're trying to teach me how to inter intersect with others who don't look like me. But it's important. We all live together. And Houston is one of the most diverse cities in the US. So I think sharing, making sure that people understand that you have, have to come out of that box. You have to come out of the way you just me, mine, my four, and no more. Those days are over. It used to be a time where you cared about other people's children on your street. We talk about National Night Out, but we, you know, it's just a, for me, I think we see it now, it's just something to do. We don't really focus on communities like we should. And I think that if we did that more, I hear, heard some of a little bit about some of the deployment strategies that NYPD has where they have officers walking uh, in the community, walking a beat, and I think that's awesome. Uh, you try to get a police officer out of the car in Houston, they'd be like, I'm quitting. <laughs> I know it's hot, I'm quitting. But uh, it's, it's about being intentional. One of the things I do, I have a program called Meet Metro Police. Once a month, we go somewhere in a community, and I take as many officers as I can, many of our toys as I can, and we're outside engaging people. We're talking to young, young at heart, sharing who we are, what, or do you think we're doing a good job? We give them contact cards. Have you had any bad experiences with, with us? Uh, have you had any experiences you want us to talk about, you want to share? Uh, do you think we're doing a good job? So I'm being intentional about making officers get out of the car. And, and at first, they didn't like it. So I did it on a volunteer. You know, who all wants to go with me? Let's go. Nobody. <laughs> so uh, now it's almost like, OK, you are going. You're going this time. So. Now they look forward to it. And then we also getting in the community, going, doing community service in our areas as far as helping. It's just not organization's responsibility. I think we do the toy drives with the department back to school. But what I did, I started doing it at the Salvation Army. I started doing it at homeless shelters, those places where people don't normally go. So we go in there, and I do it at the same one every year, and it's a shelter for uh, homeless uh, mothers and children and families. And so every time I ask for volunteers, and now I get a lot of volunteers to come, I go around the room with the officers, and I say, give the students one tip. Every time, and I don't plan this, it's at least one officer in there will say, I was homeless. I lived here. I want you to know you can make it. Not planned, and it's, I'm always in awe because I look at the officer. I'm like, wow, uh, I'm just shocked, you know. But you don't, you don't ever know who you're sitting next to, or who you're working by. You don't know anybody's story until you talk to them. 
So that's always been very powerful for me. So I think that a community engagement, the community policing is critical right now for our law enforcement agencies. Good evening, President Bumpers. Good evening. Uh, I'm Sophine Charles. President Bumpers appointed me to be the National Training and Education Chair of Noble. Yes. Thank you. Doing and an I'm, excellent job. I'm also uh, on uh, teaching in the police leadership program here at John Jay for almost 20 years, so I have roots here. Unfortunately, there are officers of color who have said and have the mindset that they won't join Noble because Noble has been known to be a career killer. Proximity to black law enforcement can taint careers, so there's a belief system about that. What would you say to officers who think that, and what can Noble actually offer them? I said this uh, to someone last week. Don't go by what you heard or what you think. Try it for yourself. Have your own testimony. And you won't know unless you come. And I've encouraged, it's not just for black officers. It's for any officer. It's for regular members or lieutenants and above, associate members or officers and sergeants. And then we have supporting membership where those who are not in law enforcement, they're civilians. But I think until you come and experience it for yourself, we can tell you all that it's the they have great training, great networking. Um, I saw it for myself. I, I'm, I'm a product of it because I started when I was a sergeant. And I would just be so eager just to be around people and listen at the training, listen to people talk about how they moved up in their careers, listen to people talk about how they solved issues and problems, how they got past some of the, the, the negatives in their agency or either, even attacks on themselves. So I, that's my response now is you're going by what you heard or what you think or what somebody told you, a negative experience, but I'm asking you, try one time, you come for yourself, and then you give us your testimony. So that would be my response. But there are members, and we encourage our members to try and to, to share, to go out and share. And I'm going to tell you, I applaud the New York chapter. They do an excellent job. It, what they're having um, Saturday, the, the event that is having, and they're always having events, mentoring events, training events, and uh, excellent job. And I, I said I wish all the chapters could pattern themselves after the New York chapter because they're doing a lot of positive things to make a difference, not only in the agency, but in our communities. So I, I definitely applaud them, but I, I just, my response is always try it for yourself. And, and we were quick to, to base our opinion on what we heard and what somebody else says, but I, I'm, I believe in having my own testimony. Okay, thank you, Madam President. Uh, I, I want to close with one question. Also, I need you to elaborate some more on behalf of the students who are here okay. under your leadership. Uh, the board just passed the resolution to create collegiate chapters yes. in Noble. Um, <laughs> long time coming. Yes. I know we were trying to get yes. this done for a while, and mm -hmm. under your leadership, we got it done. Mm -hmm. Can you talk more about that for us? Yes, uh, we do have collegiate chapters now. Uh, the Chapter the ho the chapter is a host chapter is is the chapter that will you will be up under so hopefully the New York chapter will consider uh, having a chapter here John Jay so far we have three collegiate chapters uh, and the collegiate members do come to our conferences uh, the chapter sometimes sponsors some and then some come on their own, get together and come on their own. And I was talking to a young lady who was in Houston who was a part of a collegiate chapter, and she came to our CEO symposium, and she said, I'll never miss a CEO symposium or a conference, and a white female. And uh, she's an, a, a collegiate student, but she said I, she, this was her second year. I think she's second or third year. I think she's either junior or senior, but um, she just says it is so beneficial. She gets so much from it. So hopefully we are... I know they are in the process of trying to establish a chapter at Texas Southern University in Houston and also at Prairie View University. So we look forward to that. The, the collegiate students, this is the future of law enforcement. We know you're the ones who will be coming behind those of us who are, are here now. And we want to make sure you're prepared. 
So I, I believe that Noble is the perfect training ground to get that foundation and that preparation because it goes beyond the classroom. We're talking real world experience from many who sit in this room who have, uh, like I always said, been there, done that, and have several t-shirts. So it, it's nothing like being able to network and uh, share experiences. And I might just also add to, in addition to having the, the chapter established, we also, the board just now approved the Noble Pin. Yes. Uh, you'll see that those who are not in Noble Pin. Collegiate aware, Pin. Pins, they have a unique pin now for the Collegiate members mm -hmm. too. It's kind of fancy too. It looks And a membership looks card. Right, so, so we're going the whole nine yards. Mm -hmm. So we're President, trying to do you. some special things. There you go. So Madam President, I need you to come down off stage, okay. please. I want you all to oh, uh, please excuse my southern drawl. I know when I listen to you. <laughs> I know. So you know how we say it at home, appreciate y'all. 